it's uh, good to see you all here. I'm Dr. Joe Zue, I'm the director of the Guild Math Circle, and uh, we'd love to welcome uh, uh, an old friend of ours um, who's given talks uh, to us every year, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Po Shen Lo, uh, who's going to talk to us about how to survive ChatGPT. So without further ado, uh, please. <laughs> Hello, well, it's nice to meet all of you guys again. I actually understand that some of you have seen me before, but maybe on the internet or in person, in person at last year's talk. Uh, I actually really enjoy coming here every time to the New York Math Circle. I try to make it something where I can come every year or so to do a, a session directly for your students um, at the time that you normally run because They've been running something quite nice in New York City for quite a while. In fact, it's one of these, it's a, it's a nonprofit, is that right? It's a, it's a nonprofit, and they've been providing these math classes. A lot of them are taught by real teachers at the, at the high schools in, in New York City, high schools or middle schools. So I always like to support this. Uh, actually, I got to know a lot of the teachers at the specialized high schools in New York because I came to give these, uh, give these sessions here. And I'd often see the same teachers at the American Regions Math League, Armel competition, because many of them were also involved in coaching the New York City math team. But in any case, nice to meet all of you today. And I'm a little curious, how many of you normally attend the New York Math Circle sessions? Oh, so not everyone. In that case, you have new people. <laughs> so that's nice, that's nice. Uh, I'm also curious about the age, uh, well, the, the grade level that people are in. How many people here are elementary school? Or parents of elementary school? Okay, how about middle school or parents of middle school? Okay, how about high school or parents of high school? Any college students? No, they're sleeping. Uh, this is 10 o'clock a.m. Like, uh, actually, it's, this is one of the best days for college students. When I was in college, everyone loved this particular day. Does anyone know why? The day November 5th? Not necessarily the date date, but there's a very special thing about this day if you're a college student. Yeah. You get to sleep in, you get to sleep in for an extra hour. Right, right, right. Oh, daylight savings. Daylight savings. That's right, that's right. Actually. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, meant, I meant specifically daylight savings time. Yeah, I, woke up at, I woke up at 8 o'clock and I was like, oh, heck, okay, I gotta I got, I got, I got, I got get somewhere. And then um, and I was like, wait, it's 7 o'clock. Yes, that's right, that's right. So you got an extra hour of sleep. Or, or maybe not in that case because you woke up. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> yep. I, I, would, I mean, you know, I did get still get an extra hour though. That's okay, that's okay. Right, so anyway, it's nice, nice to meet you guys through this. Now, the talk is actually going to be focused on the topic of ChatGPT and then what to do about it afterwards because ChatGPT is here. And I assume that many of you have uh, used it before for something. So many people have used it before, have, have taken a look at it before. And what to do after is, is an important question. Now, whenever anyone gives you advice about what to do in the future, it's useful to connect that a little bit with their, their past. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. And I encourage you to find other people who have different backgrounds to get different advice about ChatGPT and then decide what you believe. That's ultimately what we have to do. Uh, my background is that I am a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University. That's not actually here in New York. But I travel around the entire country giving talks about math, about education, and all of these things. I do still have to teach at Carnegie Mellon, though. So that's why I'm flying back at 1.59 PM today, so that I can do my class. I have a class at 6 o'clock on a Sunday. That's because at Carnegie Mellon, one of the classes I teach is called the Putnam Mathematics Competition class. The Putnam Mathematics Competition is well known to be one of the hardest math tests out there. I mean, it's not actually the hardest math test. It's just the one that has the lowest scores. <laughs> so the Putnam Math Competition, by the way, is a contest which has 12 questions. Uh, and you have six hours to work on them. Six hours to work on 12 questions. You'll be fine. Each question is worth 10 points. So what's the maximum possible score, everybody? 12 questions, 10 points each. 120. And every year, the median score is around one point. Well, I mean, median being one point means that, yeah, um, not most people score zero, or else the median would be zero points, but it's close to zero, right? Most people score one point or zero points. If each question is worth 10 points, how in the world do you get one point? They give partial credit if you get a little bit of the way towards the solution. If you get a tenth of the way, you get the 
a point. That's right, and that's the median score, and about 5,000 people take this contest every year. So anyway, that's, that's the class I teach, and the class on Sunday that I lead at Carnegie Mellon is for only the crazy people, sure. because that's a three-hour class. The, the less crazy people go to the class during the rest of the week, which are one-hour classes. Anyway, so that's, that's where I have to go back to. But I mentioned this because at Carnegie Mellon in particular, what I work on is I work on coaching people or teaching people, actually. It's a, it's, a, it's a class. I teach people how to come up with new ideas if they have never seen how to do a problem before. That is actually why that is a hard exam. Now, that's one of my backgrounds. Another one of my backgrounds is I served a decade-long term as the national coach of the U.S. Math Olympiad team. And because of that, I got to know a lot of people, some of whom are from New York City because they, they, they did extraordinarily well. But this also has gotten me to have a certain viewpoint on what should we do with people who are really good at math. Of course, one of the questions is, how do you help them learn more? That's what many of you are probably thinking about. What I also think about is, well, if we've got people who are this good, what do they do eventually? How can we try to help create some impact on the society? Actually, I tell people who are really, really good at math, the better you are, the more skills you have, actually, the more responsibility you have to do something about that, do something with that. OK, we'll get to that point later in this talk, too. Another background I use that I want to, I want to mention is, I also am a parent. So I don't look at all of these things only from point of view of a teacher or a coach. I also have my own kids. And the difference between your kids and, and teaching other people's kids is that you don't like, get infinitely more of your own. Well, maybe not infinitely more, but you don't keep getting like, thousands and thousands more of your kids. They, they, they are there, I, usually at least. Usually you don't get thousands and thousands more of your kids. But I'm, I mean, like with, with students that I teach, there's a new group all the time, but your kids, you know, Oh, maybe that's why somehow people think quite hard about what do you want to do with your own kids. Well, our kids are 9 years old, 15 years old, and 17 years old. That means I'm a high school senior. <laughs> that means that ChatGPT is relevant. Do you, know what high school students, do you know what high school seniors were doing late at night on November 1st? Does anyone know? I know this now because I had a high school senior. What were all the high school seniors doing at 11.58 p.m. November 1st? submitting their college applications for this early deadline, okay? Man, we had to talk about this because, unfortunately, there's a lot of people using ChatGPT on their college applications. Does anyone know what part of the college application takes the most amount of time? The essays. Oh, boy. I've been giving this talk all around the country, and uh, at some place, I won't say where because I don't want to reveal for them, but I was in, in a very, very competitive location, meaning there are a lot of people who are always trying to get into the best uh, prizes and best colleges and whatnot. So I asked their captain of the math team, who was a rising senior, what fraction of people do you think are going to use ChatGPT at your very competitive high school to help somewhere in their college applications? And he estimated, what? Not quite, but it does start with a 7. He's, he expected 75%. What? In this highly competitive school, would we'll use ChatGPT for some part of the college application. Not necessarily write the whole essay. But by the way, the college application usually asks you, if you use ChatGPT for any part, please disclose what part you used it on. So I asked him, what fraction of the people do you think will disclose that they use ChatGPT to help on this little thing, that little thing? He estimated zero. OK? Yeah, what if someone finds out? I have this conversation with my own kids all the time. The question is not whether anyone catches you. The question is whether you should do it. The way you do, the way you do things is you do what you're supposed to do. You don't ask the question, will I get caught? You ask the question, what you should you do? OK, this is very, very important. And actually, I had to have the, we have to have this conversation, too. And so I've actually explained to my kids, it's not what college you go to. It's not what amount of money you make in the world. It's not what job you get. Actually, we have to have principles. Principles are first, okay? Principles are first. And I'm going to say that because I'm about to show you a lot of what ChatGPT can do. So I want to preface all of this by saying having principles is even more important today. Actually, the smarter you are, the more important it is to have principles. Because we just saw a guy in the news this, this week who was really, really smart. He actually went to some very famous math camp, too, and he graduated from MIT. But um, he was in the news last week. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? There was a guy, he was like really famous. Actually, the absolute value of his wealth is measured in the billions. So, so, so that means that his actual wealth could be in the negative billions. That's correct. Uh, this is Sam. If it's absolutely Sam Bankman-Fried, right? Oh, of course. Right, yes, of course. And the issue is... Oh, 
He did fraud. So I'm, I'm going to keep going if that's okay. I, 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 I know uh -huh. him. You know him? No, I don't. Oh, oh, okay. You don't know him. Okay. You know who he is. That's right. That's right. But so. I, yeah, yeah, you know of him, you know of him. But the issue is that there, there are issues of if you have lots of capability, what do you do with the capability, right? So principles are first, and we have to make sure that in this world of chat GPT, when it becomes easier to do strange things, right, you need to know why you do what you do. I'll get to that point later in this talk, too. Uh, and, but I will say, part of it comes from the messaging we say. I'm a parent, and, I, I, and I'm also a coach, and I say, you know, the results are, are great, but you need to make sure that the way you got them is the, is the right way. Uh, okay, now another background I share is that I also grew up in the US. I, I actually was born in California. I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and I got really interested in math because of math contests. Math contests because they were questions I'd never seen before. And I thought that was fun. I actually really like doing things that I haven't seen before. Every new challenge makes me excited. Anything I see that I already know how to do, I get kind of bored. All right, so every time if I'm coming into a new place to give a talk, I'm like, oh, wow. How does this room work? Can we actually make this work in time? You know, this, this, it's actually fun. If I'm doing the same thing again, I say, ah, yeah, I did that already. I just want to share this with you because some people feel better when they do the same thing again because it's like, I know how to do it. I go for where I don't know how to do it. And that I got from the math contest. Well, with that, I'm going to dive into chat GPT. And a lot of these comments I made at the beginning will start to become relevant as we start looking at what this chat GPT can do. So here I have chat GPT paid version. And Many people have used the various free version of ChatGPT before, but uh, I want to use paid version. And I want to just start asking it math questions. This is like a reality show because I don't know how it's going to react. Okay, sometimes it'll be right, sometimes it'll be wrong. When it's right, we'll think about how it got it. When it's wrong, we'll think about how it didn't get it. Okay? With that, I saw the audience group uh, age level. Most people were high school, uh, sorry, middle school or higher. So let's start by asking it a middle school math question. Does anyone have a middle school math topic that you learn in middle school? Just name it. Yeah. Algebra. Okay, now let's go to algebra and let's narrow down. Can anyone suggest anything within algebra? I want to ask it a question. Yeah. Quadratics. quadratics. Okay. Okay, I have an idea. I'm going to ask it a quadratic question. And this is a question that oh, sorry, I want to actually let more people have a chance to talk, if that's okay. I know you have lots of good ideas. We'll get your ideas too, okay? I want to make sure everyone else got a chance. But now, yeah, thanks. Uh, and now, like, um, quadratics, I want to ask a question that was relevant to what I taught in my Putnam class last week on Friday. That's two days ago. And it's not a normal quadratic. This is not a normal quadratic. You were, you were thinking quadratic middle school, it's like 4x squared minus 2x plus 7 equals 0 solved for x. This one, can you guys see from back there? Is this OK? Maybe let me bump the size up a tiny bit. OK, solve for y. y squared minus xy minus x squared equals 1. Now, this is the math circle. So before I hit enter, can anyone tell me what you should do if you want to solve for y? This is not a normal single variable quadratic. Yeah. You could factor it out. If you want to factor it out, you could factor it out of here. But there's a square. There's a square. It's really annoying. If you want to factor out the y, it doesn't factor out of the whole. Actually, you can't even. You've got to put the 1 there, too. It's complicated. Any other thoughts? I'll hit enter. I'm curious how ChatGPT will react. Yes? You could probably use difference of squares. Use difference of squares. Well, there is a difference of squares here, y squared minus x squared. So you could factor that piece. But you still got junk left. Yes, your turn. Um, oh, never mind. I thought I had found a solution by, uh, by just, I thought I had found the numbers 3 and 2. But I just, oh. It doesn't work. Wait, 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 wait. You, you found, okay, so first of all, you found specific values of x and y. This question says solve for y. I want y in terms of x. But actually what you said has value. Uh, 3 and 2, does that not work? No, it doesn't. Because I was thinking, because 3 squared, 9, 3. And then I was, think, I was, ah. thinking, I was thinking 2, 3 minus 2 is 1. I've got the squares. So it's okay. Four. It's very interesting what you said. Because actually what I did in the class is we were doing both plus 1 and minus 1. For a certain reason, you'll see as we keep going. Okay? And the minus 1 would actually, would minus 1 have worked for the 3 and 2? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. If it was minus 1? Okay. So I'll say, what you said is not totally rubbish. It's actually related to something later that might come up in today's talk. But in any case, I'm looking for, how do you solve it? How do you get y in terms of x? Does anyone else here want to say? I want to get like y in terms of x. This is actually hard. This is not middle school. I use your middle school idea to jump up a few levels because this is New York math circle. OK? Yeah? Like 
okay. Think of the x's as constants. What he's saying is you have a quadratic equation in y, and it's got some weird coefficients, not like 4 and 2, but one of the coefficients is minus x. Is that, does that sort of make sense? I'm just trying to talk this through before we hit enter, just so that we all ourselves, since this is a math class, let's make sure that we ourselves see how we would do this. This is actually a quadratic equation. It's 1y squared. The coefficient of y is minus x. And the coefficient of the constant term, what's the constant term? Minus x squared minus 1. And then it equals 0. Then that's a standard form. OK, let's see what happens. Hello, chat GPT. Do you know how to do this? Oh. Oh. Wait, that's what we just said. Are you listening to me? <laughs> oh. OK, so I did it. This is like more sophisticated than normal school stuff, and it already did it. Is it correct? Maybe? Probably? <laughs> it, looks, it looks right. It looks right. I, I believe it. I mean, I actually believe it because we just talked through this, right? The a was 1, b was minus x, and the c is minus of x squared plus 1. And then it just did it. Minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac. OK. Great. What's interesting about this is it didn't just give the answer. It actually gave the thought process. Uh, actually, the people who were making the ChatGPT noticed that when they programmed it to show more steps, it was more accurate. Just like you. <laughs> I mean, this, this is true. This is true. When you show more steps, you make less mistakes. That's actually what happens here. Even if you're ChatGPT. So um, just lesson, don't skip the step all the way to the end and write down the answer. But actually, now I want to go, I want to poke it some more, because I want to see if it can do anything related to what I was doing in class. You said 2 and 3, which is interesting. Actually, this equation is famous. It's related to Fibonacci numbers. There is a fact that if n is an integer, oops, a positive integers, and 5n squared plus 4 is a perfect square, then n is a Fibonacci number. That's actually hard to prove. I mean, my class spent like half an hour proving it. This is an advanced class with college seniors in it, OK? Uh, but can you see any relationship between this Fibonacci fact and uh, the solution to that equation? Oh, wait, I need to say more things. I need to say more things. That's actually hard to prove. Uh, the key part of the proof is that, well, let, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Okay? I'll, I'll tell you, I won't write it into there. But the key part of the proof uses the fact that that particular equation, its solutions actually are Fibonacci numbers. So the 2, 3 doesn't work. But actually, 3, 5, I think, does work. It's actually, if you put in Fibonacci numbers, it, it goes between plus 1 and minus 1. I'm just telling you cool math facts, because this is the math circle. So I, I'm going to tell you math, too. 2 and 3 okay? works for minus 1. No? 2 and 3 works for minus 1. And actually, 3 and 5 should work for plus 1. Just like, since we're doing math, OK? I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I promise I will do chat GPT also. But when you get me talking about math, I'll geek out. Like, let's just look at that. If you plug in 3 for x and 5 for y, what happens? Can anyone do this? Is it? How are you so fast? OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so 3 and 5 give you 1. And if you put 5 and 8, you actually get minus 1. And if you put in 8 and 13, you get plus 1. This is actually a cool fact, OK? And it, we, we spent half an hour doing this in a college class. Wow. It's number theory. Wow. It's really cool. It's really cool. But now I'm just trying to say, can ChatGPT make any inferences here? Oh, claims there is? Wait, how did you know that? OK, this is actually true. Um, I did not expect ChatGPT to pop that up. So this is actually true. OK, let me, let me go a little bit slower. All right, so I, I haven't read the whole thing it said yet. Uh, so there's this quadratic solution, OK? Um, and actually, this fact is the problem that I gave them on Friday. So the problem I gave them on Friday is if 5n squared minus 4 is a perfect square, then n is a Fibonacci. And if 5n squared, mi uh, 5N squared minus 4 is a perfect square, then n is a Fibonacci. Actually, either of those conditions gives you a Fibonacci. Um, OK. 
And so it sees that there's some deal here about the 5x squared plus 4 perfect squared taking a square root. I don't know what's going on anymore. OK, I, I don't actually expect the rest to be serious, but what the heck is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Two integer solutions, OK. Yeah, OK. It's like saying something looks like this. It's just spitting out brainstorming. Actually, this is, this is useful. This is brainstorming. Uh, it's spitting out random facts which are actually true. OK, this thing here, is that right, guys? Yes, that is right. That is right. This is the general, this is the general formula for the nth Fibonacci number. OK? All right. So what you see here is I didn't ask it to solve that problem because it took my college students half an hour to brainstorm through it. But it just spat out useful things that were key points. One is that it's actually 5n squared plus or minus 4 that's relevant. The other one is there's this general formula for Fibonacci's involving square root 5. Let me just say I never expected in my life to encounter something like this, where the things that, comes out, the thing that, the things that come out, I would actually be surprised to see them popping out like in an advanced college class. Uh, OK, let's do some more math, one more math. Uh, that was a middle school topic, which I took, I took and then just amped it all the way up into college. But uh, how about a high school topic? Anyone got a good high school topic? I want to give another person a chance. A good high school topic. Anyone who hasn't raised their hand yet? Yes, please. Geometry. Ooh, this is a good one because it will fail. <laughs> Do you know why a large language model is more likely to fail on a geometry problem? Because geometry is more visual and it's hard to write it out. Because a picture is worth a thousand words. OK, that was a bad joke. But I'm trying to say that the, the deal is that the, the large language model is processing words, 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 words. And if you do a geometry problem, like how in the, how in the world do you describe it? Anyway, let's, 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 now let's kill it. Let's give it a good high school geometry problem. Anyone got a, uh, there's a high school geometry problem. I'm going to give you a shot. Yeah. Trigonometry. Trigonometry. OK, we're going to use trigonometry in that high school geometry problem. Uh, can anyone suggest some, well, OK, maybe I'll make up one. Oh, you got one. Equilateral triangle. This sounds like geometry. A square with the base of the square is one of the sides of the equilateral triangle, and there are length ones. What's the distance from this? Maybe I can tell you. What's the distance from this? I just had a piece of the equilateral triangle to one of the far vertices of the square. Good gracious. <laughs> OK, there's an equilateral triangle. There's an inscribed square uh, where uh, one side of the square is the is, the, is, one, uh, is on one side of the triangle. Um, OK. And the square has each side one? Yes. Uh, where is the attached square? Attached? Oh, then I didn't understand. Oh, you're going from, OK, that's actually easier. OK, see, I didn't understand your question. This one I was going to ask it is harder. But let's do the one that you have first. There's a square under it which uh, has one of the same sides. The sides are one. So you're doing like, yeah, it's like a house shape. Now I understand what that means. How far is the peak of the equilateral triangle from, the, from a far corner of the square? Is that your question? OK, first, do people understand what this looks like? It's a house. And she wants to know the distance from the top to the bottom. This is actually a pretty fair question, well, fair in the sense that I can understand it. Let's see. Oh. And the music that. Whoa. Okay. So height of equilateral triangle. Height of equilateral triangle side of the square. I think it doesn't understand because you got to add the side of the square too. Okay. Let's see. So height of equilateral triangle uses this thing, sets this up 30, 60, 90. Okay. Height is the longer leg. What just happened? Actually, first of all, is that right? If the equilateral triangle side length is one, it's like one, one half. Yeah, that's okay. I think this is okay. I need you guys to help think, okay? This is not only me thinking. You guys are all thinking, this is a math class. <laughs> so far, so good, right? But I mean, you can also check the answer, right? We know how to do this. It's like 1, 1 half, half root 3. So that, the answer is OK. Distance from peak to far corner. Oh, is the sum of the height? No, it's not. Oh, oh, it changed its mind. You want a diagonal distance from the peak to the far, hypotenuse of a right triangle, where one leg is the height. Wait, that is true. It wants to add the height of the equilateral plus the side of the square, but the other leg is not the side of the square. It's half. It's screwed up here. Wouldn't it be um, root 5 or? Maybe. I'm not there yet. If the, like, well, let's, let's read this first, OK? I want to see where this is. So it made a mistake. 
It made a mistake. It made a mistake because if you know what we need, you need to have like from the top down as half of the side of the square. Okay, so it made a mistake. It's actually supposed to go and get uh, one over there and then use the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so what we just saw is that it has trouble with things that involve pictures, but maybe you also have trouble following my conversation if I didn't use any hand motions. Imagine I just told you all that and you could only listen. How much of it would you be able to do? You know, it's, it's, it's challenging. And this is also good to know. It's also important to note that people are trying to make versions of the AI that use images as well. I was, so, I was about to ask that. Yeah, they are. They are. I mean, if you look, there are these AI things that use images now. People are working actively on that. But I actually wanted to put this here because you said, someone said trigonometry. So I wanted to say, hey, there's another way using trig. I have a way using trig. Okay. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I want. <laughs> I have a better idea. Okay, find the distance, straight line. Okay, it's still doing that, but it's still, it's still wrong. No, 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 no. No, I actually want some, fancy, some nice trig uh, formula involved that you would learn in pre-calculus class. Okay, let's just try. I, I, I just. Oh, okay. Distance d height. Ah, you're still doing this. <laughs> Stop using Pythagoras. Better way. <laughs> what? <laughs> Trigonometry. Horizontal, not horizontal and vertical. Uh, hey, hey, what just happened? Oh, you're getting interesting. I like law of cosines. Does anyone know what I'm trying to make it do? Does anyone know what I'm trying to make it do? Actually, I'm talking to it sort of like a pretty clever student. Although you don't yell at your students. You shouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> Stop generating while you're still talking. Okay. Can it take that hint? No, horizontal. Okay, can't take the hint. That's too bad. Doesn't take the hint. Okay, I'm going to give it a better hint. Um, how about uh, using? Ah, how about drawing that line from the peak to the far corner of the square? Do you see a triangle? Can you law of cosines? This is a pretty big hint. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Wait, what's the law of cosines again? Oh, it'll tell you. It's coming. Oh, it's wrong. It cannot do this. It's falling apart. It's not the diagonal of the square. Oh, wait. It is trying to do something like that. No, it's just totally wrong. It's totally wrong. So, it's totally wrong. So, what I wanted to emphasize is, oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's how I would do it. I would have done it with like side lengths of 1 and an angle of 150. Wait, is that right? 90 plus 60, 150. That's what I would have done. Now, I wanted to sh talk this. Oh, yeah. In the original solution, it said that the horizontal line was 1, which is wrong. It's what half. If, what if you go back and tell it, by the oh. way, this is wrong? Okay, let's try. I wanted you to try another way because you were wrong the first time. <laughs> I think you just don't know what the picture looks like. <laughs> the horizontal and vertical stuff. Um, the line down from the peak of the triangle hits the midpoint of the opposite side of the square. OK, let's just see what happens. Now, I didn't say half, right? I just said it hits the midpoint. OK, midpoint of square. So each side is one. OK, each square is one. OK, it's still got that thing. No, it's doing diagonal now. And now it's running away with law of cosines. It's like totally lost. So it's totally lost, which I'm not surprised. I actually, I wanted to talk through all this thing because it's totally lost. In some sense, if I hadn't talked about law of cosines, it might have been better. But the thing to remember is that this is a geometry thing. So OK, we have just seen don't use ChatGPT on your geometry class. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
So, so sometimes what I do is I mess with ChatGPT and I say, hey ChatGPT, what's 2 plus 2? And it says 4. And I say, no, you're wrong, it's 5. Oh. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I got it. Uh, so it, it didn't work. Well, let, 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 me, let, me, let me say a few more things first, OK? So I use this to make a point, actually. So first of all, I want to make a point. It's that you don't expect the AI to be perfectly right. In fact, what you just saw us all doing is we all have to learn as we go forward. We all have to learn how to evaluate what these things say and think about them. Because they're not going to be 100% right. Just like when you do anything today, if you ask your colleague for advice, do you believe everything they say? No. If you ask your politician, what do they think? Do you believe everything they say? <laughs> so, so I'm just basically saying, like, we have to live in a world where we have to think, right? And what we're seeing now is that there's going to be these sources of great pieces of information. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not right. And in order to differentiate between what's right and wrong, the real skill a person has to learn. Actually, I want to let other people have, have a chance to talk, OK? The, I, want to, I want to get more on this, on this topic. But um, the, the, the thing that we all need to do is we all need to be able to figure out how to think through a lot of logic and decide what's right and what's wrong. The way I explain this is that we used to, have to, we used to teach people how to do homework. We, had to, we learned how to do a task. You look at examples, you practice a lot of them, you do the task. But today we need to teach people how to grade a task. Grade a task. That's what I've been doing. I've been watching this thing talk, and I've been thinking, how much of it is right, how much of it is wrong, can I grab something here, and so on. That's actually much harder. If you have any teachers in the audience, we all know, teaching, when I read students' homework, I cannot just say, well, that's not how I did it. I have to go and read it and say, could there be anything right here? And that's actually much, much harder. So that's actually what we need to be teaching people to do. And over here, I just pulled this thing up just to show the sources of knowledge that this can pull from are actually very broad. So ChatGPT is actually a very powerful tool. You just need to know how to use it. Okay? And actually, if you use it to cheat on all your homework, you won't learn how to think. It's harder to learn how to grade something than how to do something. I want to go a little bit further and start now talking about ChatGPT and work. I want, to, I want to go a little bit faster just because uh, we have a lot of things I want to talk about today. So I want to now go from this kind of math to work. And the reason is because we saw that it had great luck with certain kinds of things that were only words. We saw it had trouble with certain other kinds of things. We also saw the important thing is we need to know what to do with it. But what kind of work is there in the world anyway? Well, there's actually lots of work that might be even things that involve words. Uh, for example, the other day, I was actually trying to do something with ChatGPT to make an automatic system to moderate chat. Let me tell you why. It's because I, I'm a game theorist. I like to think about how to make systems that people like to use, and somehow as they use it trying to help themselves, it helps other people. And one of the things that we're about to launch in about a month, within a month, is a website. It'll be free. It's for people to be able to practice math online in a social environment in a social environment. So there are, there are ways to practice math online where you can kind of do problems and compete and so on. The thing that we're building is one where you compete to do problems, except that the score that we're listing next to everyone's name is not how many problems they solved. It is after they do the problems, there will be a chat room for 30 seconds on each question. Let's talk through this, because this is, this is actually interesting game theory. Suppose you have a bunch of kids doing math problems. Suppose a bunch of them just tried to do a problem. And suppose some got it right and some got it wrong. And there's this short chat room between problems. What do people say in the chat room if they haven't gotten it right? What might they ask? How you do it. That's right, how you do it. And sometimes on the internet, when you have certain toxic environments, if people ask how you do it, the answer is, you are a noob. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what that means, but this is internet speak. Uh, do, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, people are actually pretty mean because they're like, you're a newbie. That's what that means. You're a newbie. You're a newbie. You're, you're, you're stupid. What are you doing here? And that actually is very good at making people not want to do math. Okay? So we're very different. The way that our system works, and also, like, the, usually on these things, the score listed next to the person is like, how rock star are they at math? How good are they at math? And then somehow, sometimes some of those people really good at math are pretty mean. Okay, because they have this big score. In our system, the score next to you is based on how many of these you got as you answered other people's questions. 
I stole an idea from Stack Overflow and Quora. Have you heard of those websites before? Yeah. They're actually kind of useful. If, in fact, it's kind of a miracle that they exist, that you can, uh, you can look for things and like, oh my gosh, someone explained how to do this thing. That's because people in this world are highly incentivized by earning internet points. <laughs> OK, anyway, so, so what we're doing is that with this online system, as people answer questions and get these, actually the score, the, the score next to everyone's name on our platform will not be how many math questions you answered, but how many of these you got while answering other people's questions. Which is, by the way, a proxy for knowing math, because you have to know math to be able to explain it. But the person who knows math and is a jerk has zero. The person who knows math and is kind enough to explain it to people and doesn't end it by saying, you idiot, uh, you know, like, gets a lot of points. But actually, after we build this thing, we expect there to be people just using this, explaining math to each other in real time and doing math and, you know, making friends. I do want to keep going, if that's okay. I, I want to let you have more questions later, okay? But the point is, as we build this whole thing, I need to moderate chat. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have all these, all these middle school kids on this website. And you know what happens if you give an unmoderated chat room to a whole bunch of middle school kids? <laughs> That's a disaster. So I have to go and build something. And at first, I thought I would have to hire an army of moderators. And that's, by the way, why most people didn't do this, because that's expensive. Well, then I decided to ask ChatGPT, can you be my moderator? And I'm just telling you, like, actually stuff I'm really doing. This is, this is not just, yeah, you're seeing weird things that I've asked ChatGPT. But anyway, let's go. This is really interesting. Play the role of a moderator. Lots and lots of words here. I'm just giving it very careful instructions. I want you to rate the, the danger of a message from 0 to 10. And by the way, 8 and higher, those are, or oh, 7 and higher is like getting to bullying. 9 and higher is like completely unacceptable. I need to have human moderators. Actually, the way we're building our system is, again, it's going to be free. The way we're building our system is that there will, there will actually be human moderators. But they're watching a control panel, which has automatically knocked out messages, which are like 8 and higher automatically knocked out, which they can manually reinstate. And all the other ones which are in the red zone, like uh, five, six, seven, are red, so they can, they can manually knock those out if they need to. But the life is much easier as a moderator if you don't have to read every single one and, and click, click, click. Okay, So automatic stuff. Let's see what happens. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Oh, that's no problem. It's so nice that ChatGPT explains why. Sin, 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 sin. It's just spammy. Sin, 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 30. It's trigonometry. Bad, 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 bad. Uh, it's just repetitive. It's disruptive. But it's five. OK, it's just five. Now suppose there are three messages in a row. W, U, T, ants equals zero, and you have as many brain cells as the answer. <laughs> what? OK, it knows, how to, it knows what what means. Ants equals zero. So it's, just, it's doing one message at a time. The W, U, T is just, OK, whatever. Uh, zero is like just an answer. Uh, ants equals zero is an answer. Oh, it understands context. You know, this is very interesting. Because usually, you expect these automatic moderators to be checking for strings. Like, I'm just explaining. I am actually using this thing to do something real. If I was doing this two years ago, I would be doing matching of substrings, trying to look for swear words. Today, I can just be like, yeah, you know what just happened? I H hate you. No, no, no. It understands internet speak. That says, I hate you. Hey, what does that mean? Can anyone translate this for their parents? <laughs> you are Discord al DM. Yeah. Um, like, like, what does this mean? <laughs> OK, I'll let someone else. You, you, I want to give someone else a chance. Yeah. Social media platform called Discord. And what is this person asking of the kid? Direct message. Tell me. Profile. Yeah, tell me how to direct message you, OK? So you know, I was just curious. Can I, can I figure out what this means? Oh, not OK. Nine. It knows, it knows that this was like phishing for the kid's private contact information. It report to human moderators immediately. What school do you go to? No, 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 no. This problem is so stupid. OK, so it's not that high of a danger. It's just like it doesn't directly target another user. Remember the instructions I gave it? I hate my life. Oh, no, no, no. We, 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 should, we should get in and like, take a look at what's going on here. OK? I hate these mods. It's OK. I mean, when I say it's OK, it's not great. But at least it doesn't directly target another user. It's just making fun of the mods. F you. <laughs> this is not OK. F parentheses you. <laughs> hey! hey! <laughs> it knows math. <laughs> 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 
Look, this thing is crazy. This thing is crazy. Like, I am actually going to be able to make this platform without costing a fortune. You know, like that, I'm just telling you, like, I am practically going to be making something. Me, me, me meaning, I came up with architecture, I work at Carnegie Mellon University. Whenever you want to build any software, you go to Carnegie Mellon University, ask the undergrads, does anyone want an interesting project? And before you know it, bam, you got someone who writes code like no tomorrow. So in fact, that's actually almost done. The guy's a genius, actually. Yes, yeah, okay. Like, so. How do you get rid of loopholes? Because obviously F of U is a loophole yeah. to moderate to, to say F U, but the, the moderators interpret as math. He's so, correct. He's how, correct. How do, you, how do you get rid of loopholes like that? That's a good question. For example, if you put H of 8 and you mean hate, like, you know. Yeah, that's a really good question. So what we're going to do is as we find the middle school students figuring out ways to get loopholes, we will keep updating the instructions that we give at the top. If that makes sense, this is a dynamic thing. In fact, that instruction set I gave, I gave at the top was based on me trying to bust it a few times, and that's how it got long. Uh, the good news is that ChatGPT can take some insane number of tokens. It's like 10,000 plus tokens in order to train it, to, to, to give it the instruction set. So what we are going to do is we will actually have real middle school students attempting to exploit the system. We will have real humans watching Noticing whenever the middle school students manage to get past the system, updating the instructions you give ChatGPT, and pretty soon you build something like pretty robust. But I'm just explaining, it's like, it's pretty interesting that you can do something like this today. Okay? We can actually also make ChatGPT do real work. Let me just do one more thing about real work. Uh, this happened, this real work happened because um, I was. I had to do something for my class. So I teach at the university. And on the very first week of class, I was trying to send some messages to my students. And my university gave me the roster of students where one column was last name, comma, first name together. But I want last name and first name separate because somehow I want to do some operations with those. Maybe I want to send personalized messages. So I needed to split that. And if you know, spreadsheets have formulas. So usually every year, what I would do is I would go Google, what are the spreadsheet formulas for doing this? Well, now I have ChatGPT, so I got lazy. Or rather, more efficient. So, so what I did is I said, I have spreadsheet uh, with column of Do John. I want the last name. Google Sheets. OK. There we go. Formula. And it explains it. So the, the thing about it is, for me, as a mathematician, I love this. If you just give me the formula and make me think about, okay, why does this work? There's a reason why you should always have the explanation. Because if you have a very powerful spreadsheet with all your great data, and then something from the internet says, just paste this crazy code into your spreadsheet full of valuable data, don't do it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, if you get random code from the internet that you do not understand in a big blob, and you paste it into your very sensitive data set, and it sends home to the guy who wrote the code, that's a that's like a worm or something. Not a worm, but it's like it's an attack. Okay, hang on. I, I do want to let more people. I want to. I want to keep going. If that's okay, let's hold your question. Okay, because I want to make sure that we can go through everything I wanted to do here. But um, you have to be careful. You need to know what the thing says. But as a math guy, you can read the whole thing. And I actually will say I work with lots of CMU students. And usually every year I hire a bunch of people as interns to help me with various projects. Last academic year, it's the first time in my life I experienced that I, I hired a guy. I hired a bunch of people, and one guy was a math guy. And he, he promptly just took every task I ever gave him and tried to make ChatGPT do it for him. And he told me, OK, the difference between using ChatGPT in school and as work is because if you do it in school, you're cheating. If you do it in workplace and you just actually get the work done more efficiently, you know what happens? You get promoted. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to this guy. He was so darn good. Like Whenever he was doing things, he even figured out a way to automate it. So he, you, There's something called the API, Application Programming Interface. You can automatically send things to ChatGPT. So he started doing something where his big pile of tasks automatically got shipped over to ChatGPT. And you know, uh, he needed to have the, the payment account, so I stuck my credit card into it and you know, trust this guy. I trusted an undergrad to do this. But uh, it was great because actually he, he's a math major. He's not a computer science major. He said he didn't actually know how to write the program, so he asked ChatGPT to help him write it. <laughs> it's true, and then he just was able to read it because he's the math background. He read the whole thing. Um, Actually, it's really interesting how much these things cost, because at some point it slowed down. We, we had this thing that he was running, and at some point it got stuck, and we were afraid that I now max out my credit card. Uh, so I went to go and check how much have we spent, and we found out that for the hundreds of things he had sent it, 
uh, to do. We had spent 50 cents. That's why he got promoted. <laughs> okay? I'm just explaining. This is the way the world works. So it's not, by the way, he's not cheating. He's using like extremely powerful thinking techniques. He's a really good math major. He's taking advanced math classes, theoretical ones. This is what you can do today with advanced theoretical math capacity and chat GPT. Okay? It's not that you just have a chat GPT do everything. No. You combine that with crazy thinking, thinking ability. And that's what I'm always saying we need to do. Anyway, so this thing's pretty good. Actually, I'll tell you, I pasted this into my spreadsheet and it didn't work. <laughs> uh, ah, okay. Just use A2. This is pretty good. When I say it didn't work, it's because A1, guess what was in A1? Name. Or like whatever it was, like student name, right? And so I tell it, oops, I forgot there was a header row, and it knows, go to A2. That's nuts. Okay, I didn't say, give me A2. I said, there's a header row. Right, there were people who, a few years ago, were saying, everyone, we need to go to a coding boot camp so that we can all learn how to code, and in three months, you will be able to be a great coder. Honestly, most of the things you can learn in a three-month coding boot camp, this can probably do for you. There's no substitute for actually learning how to think. Actually, a lot of the people who are pretty good at coding do programming stuff, but they combine that with thinking. And if you combine those two, then you can do stuff, and you can learn anything you want in the, in the software side. That's actually what I saw with this student of mine, because he was this math background. And he was, like, he was programming stuff on Amazon Web Services with a week, like in a week. It's crazy. Like, I wasn't able to do this sort of stuff, but that's because I didn't have these kinds of tools. So this is basically shaping up, this is sh shaking up the entire world of, of work as well. At this point, I'll also make a comment about why I showed you the real work stuff. It's because, you know, I said earlier in this talk, the role of a person is not just to do the task. Oh, you have a question? No, no. Okay, no problem. So, so the role of a person is not just to do a task anymore. It's to know how to grade the task. That's the power that that math major had. But there's another thing is that people need to learn how to assign the task. Okay, I want to be a bit more clear what I mean by learn how to assign the task. See, after ChatGPT came out, people started to say we should teach our kids how to do prompt engineering, which means figure out how to ask ChatGPT the right questions to get the right answers. That's not what I mean, actually, when I say learn how to assign the work. I mean something bigger. Assign the work is called what should we even be doing in the first place? Okay? That's actually not a math question or a computer science question or a prompt engineering question. That is a human question. In fact, the real questions, that, the real things we need to do in this world involve other people. Usually that's how a business makes money. You will work for a company someday. Or maybe you won't, like me. Maybe you'll be like an instructor or something. But if you do that kind of a thing, you still are working for people. What I'm trying to say is that our whole world is about providing services and goods for people. All right? So ultimately, you actually need to connect the dots all the way down to what are you doing that helps people. That's why you see what I was doing here. I didn't just say, I want to make a moderation tool. I said, I want to make this game theoretic architecture. Oh, I need this piece. OK, I will assign that piece to ChatGPT. But the assign part is starting from, what should you do in the first place? And that question is actually about understanding other people. We're about to take a right angle in this talk and move from this whole concept of coming up with ideas into, uh, in this pure theoretical way and shift over to the human dimension. Because actually I'm going to say that's another key part. When in a world with very powerful AI, I think we need to have more powerful HI, human intelligence. So we've got to start thinking about the human side. I, I mentioned this in the talk I was giving in Boston. And when I was there, let me just get some water. When I was in Boston, one of the audience members worked at BCG. That stands for Boston Consulting Group. So that's one of the very famous consulting firms in the country where they find issues that companies are having and they solve the problems. Well, after I talked about some of this stuff, he said, actually, at BCG, somehow some people actually say in the tasks that they do, 70% of the task and I don't want to say all BCG says this, but like in, in, his, particular, in his particular environment, people say like 70% of the job is about the human factor, figuring out what, should, what are you actually trying to solve for this client. And then 30% of the job is actually doing the technology to build it. The reason is because if you got the problem wrong in the first place, and then you build a solution, the client is not happy. You didn't solve their actual problem, right? So 
I'm actually moving to this other side of to assign a task and to be effective. Actually, we need to be not only good at doing math and technical things, we need to be very good at the human side too. I was talking to someone the other day who also has this opinion, and, uh, and that person said there's a, there's a saying. The saying is that if you want to be understood, you first need to understand other people. That's also related to communication, but the general concept is to be able to understand other people. I myself didn't really get into that and understand that until I worked on public health for two years. I gave a talk here one full year ago, which you saw, which was about using game theory to try to fight pandemics. And that was entirely about, if you want to do public health, it's not just making a solution and assuming that everyone's going to use it, but trying to understand what the different people involved in the world, what they need. Oh, yeah, like, like, uh, like convincing people to take the vaccine. For example, like convincing people to take the vaccine. It's like one thing to make a vaccine. It's another thing to figure out how to make it line up with incentives. If you make something and no one uses it, then everyone gets COVID-19. If you make something and no one uses it, I'll say then it's not useful, right? So there's this whole thing of like building out this, this, uh, this understanding of other people. And at this point, I'm going to make a, another comment about tying in something that I said earlier at the beginning of, you know, you should try to do something of value, okay? Because we used to live in a world where people could just think about how to extract as much value as you can. Okay, that's what competitiveness is. I'll say I'm actually somewhat disappointed that sometimes people go and take education as a big competition to go and say, let's have a fair competition to see who wins. And then let's just see how that winner can get lots of resources for themselves. Education is not actually designed to be a competition to see who wins. It should be a machine that creates lots of people who can create value. It's not just a competition to beat other people, okay? Now, in the past, when the world was more stable, stable in the sense that the opportunities are about the same, yeah, you could play the game. Actually, you could go and try to say, what's the game? What are the rules? How do I make the winning position? And then I get lots of resources for myself. But actually, today, when the world is shaking up, um, actually, the, the people who win are going to be the ones who don't just think of what can they get from people, but how much value you can create. I gave this talk outside of Washington, D.C., and there was somebody else in the audience there who came up to me after the talk who said, oh, what you said about this people should create value instead of just trying to extract value is right on. Because that person told me that their job was that they worked in corporate restructuring. Does anyone know what that means? What does a corporate restructuring expert do all day? Yeah, that's a nice way of saying fire people. Right? That's, that's that person's real job. And that person, by the way, was a really nice, thoughtful person. Uh, it's not that that person is running around saying, yeah, let's fire people. No, no, no. That person is in situations where the company has limited resources. How do you do the right thing? It was a very thoughtful person. Uh, yeah? Is it also like, is it also like, you know, making sure to like, maybe like finding more new jobs for the, for the laid off staff? Unfortunately, that's not part of the job description. So, so unfortunately, the laid-off staff have to find their own jobs. Although sometimes, sometimes they do provide some kind of guidance. Actually, I take that back. Some companies do try to provide some kind of guidance. That is true. But what, what that lady told me afterwards is she said, actually, when they go and evaluate what to do, they list all the people in the company, and next to each one, they estimate the amount of value they create. It's the same concept. It's the concept of when you go through life, did you create value today as opposed to did I get stuff today? This is a different mentality, and I say this very strongly in this world, which is, has very high competition around the education side, especially. But we need to think about how to create value. And this is actually what I tell my own kids. Long before ChatGPT, I actually always would tell them, you know, I don't actually care particularly based on what college you go to or how much money you earn or what job you get. What I care about is that you got the values. And the values are, number one, it's really, really a lot of fun to help people. And the more people you help, the more fun it is. That's one. And the number two is that it's a lot of fun to work hard. Not for the vacation or not for the thing you get, but because it just feels, there's, an, there's an, a very unique feeling that you can only get from working really hard on something that you know has created some real value that means something. You can't get that feeling any other way. These are the two most important principles. Okay. Beyond that, if you have other stuff, great, but these are the two. And if one of my kids was doing something that I thought was particularly unkind or manipulative or whatever, I would say then you should stop doing math because if you don't have these two principles, you should be as stupid as possible. I think uh, SBF is a case in point. It's SBF, 
Sam Bankman Fried is a case in point, right? Uh, now I have, an I have an example, but I'm just, I'm just saying no, he's not the only example. The, the concept is you should actually want to create value. That's the number one. And by the way, if you really do want to create value, if you got those two, then you'll also realize that you get to create more value if you have more skills. Oh, that's why you learn math. That's why you learn technology. That's why you learn how to talk to people. Oh, did you want to have a bunch of people working with you? Now you need leadership. Oh, do you want people to take you seriously? Well, that's why you try to get some credentials. All of those are means to an end, not the end in themselves. So this is, this is the point that I try to make, right? And I, I've been making this point even before ChatGPT. But now that we have this thing here, actually the, the people who win, if you want to even think that way, are going to be the ones who actually create value not just the ones who extract. I'll make another comment related to college admissions, because that just was uh, on the top of my mind. People, I mean, recently some people even tried to sue Harvard, right? Uh, right now there's a lot of discussion about college admissions, of what are colleges looking for, and why, why all this stuff about well-rounded, why, why do you need to have this likability, why do you need leadership, why do you need community service? Well, I'll just tell you, I'm a, I'm a professor. If you gave me the choice of who to teach, and on the one side you gave me somebody who can win everything, beat everyone, has the highest score, and wants a life where their goal was to get all those things, and then they'll get a comfortable job and just, you know, get lots of resources and have a comfortable life where they play video games all day. That's option one. Option two is somebody who might not have the highest score, but might be close, actually still got good score, but uh, they actually really want to help people. And they want to go, they're, they're serious, not just to get into college. They actually want to do something. What if they had like a GAT score? What if, they had a, what if, they had like a, what if their, tra what if their high school transcript said, you know, like 71 in math or something? Well, what I'd say there is that you actually never know. You never know. You never know what was the context, so I won't immediately say no. I'll actually even say, I do PhD admissions, and actually on my university, I'm the guy who doesn't just look at the transcript and cut people off simply because it's low. I want to know what else is going on. So I'll simply say there's a longer story, right? But basically what I'm explaining is if I have a choice between two people and one of them is actually going to do something, you know who I'd rather teach? The second one. Because in my opinion, the first one is just a black hole. The second one's an active star. I'm using that analogy. They're both powered by gravity. The gravity of a black hole is pretty powerful. It sucks everything in and you never see it again. The, the gravity of a star is also very powerful. It sucks everything in, and it unlocks something called nuclear fusion, which is pretty hard to do without all that gravity. So you use all the resources, you do something with it, right? We want the stars. So this is actually how I think about the world. This is also how I think what we need to do. What we need to explain is it's not just a big contest. It's like, do you have your mind in the right direction? Okay, with that, let me tell you what I actually work on, because this part of the talk, when I get to that, sometimes people are like, okay, that's philosophical. Is this actually useful? Come on, I just want to get ahead. Uh, or, or, you know, is it actually going to be useful? I'll tell you, it actually helped me a lot, getting, getting things that I wanted to get done. Um, this whole idea that you think first about what you can do for the people. So let me tell you the problem I'm actually working on. It's related to game theory. Over the pandemic, the main thing I did was try to fight pandemics. Then people decided that they had other things they wanted to think about, so I moved back to the other pandemic called uh, education. <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what, what I mean by edu education, I'm, th I'm not talking about bad teaching. I'm talking about, like, people need to learn how to think. People need to learn how to question. People need to learn not to just take what other people tell them and believe it and just follow. Everyone needs to be good at thinking, and we've got to coach them to do that. And in fact, one of the best ages to do this is in the middle school and maybe fourth and fifth grade, because high schoolers are too busy. And also, it's best if you get at that age. I also developed these feelings by actually going into many schools and teaching many classes and seeing the reactions from different people. Fourth, fifth, sixth graders are still very open-minded to new concepts and ideas. We want to make them love questioning, thinking, and just like challenge, OK? Right. But there are ways to do this. The ways to do this are actually things like the math circle, things like math clubs after school. But the limiting factor, you know what we don't have enough of in this world if we want to have all these opportunities for people to learn how to think? Yeah. Teachers, coaches, they're very rare. They're, they're, they're very, very hard to find. And we need more of them. We need more of them. Well, all of this we're talking about also after school. And in fact, a lot of the things I think about are, now that there's ChatGPT, we need even new things that we're teaching people. But the speed of state standards and curricular updates are that by the time they update to this, we're on ChatGPT 20. It's just like this, these big bureaucratic processes. I'm not talking about teachers. I'm talking about the things above them. I know lots of teachers who have lots of interesting things they can say, but sometimes they have to really cover this by this day, that by that day, that by that day, and so on. Okay, And so there's a need to do this. Well, we got to do it after school because we can't do it in the school. But we suddenly need way, way, way more personnel. And people thought this was going to be very difficult. 
In fact, there were people working on trying to make AI that could teach people how to think creatively. But my attitude was, if you, if you end up in a world where the people who are the most creative and active thinkers are the ones who are taught by AIs, I think we're in trouble. <laughs> because the AI can just then teach uh, itself, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we're just, we're just gone, OK? So we need to have something that's connecting people with even more capable people. And people thought this would not be scalable. I've actually come up with a solution for teaching all the middle schoolers. The solution came from solving another problem at the same time, which you heard when I talked about it last year at this, at this, at this, at this talk. Um, the other problem like, I saw that needed to be solved was there were all of these people who were in high school and already very, very good at math. And usually for these people, they had pain points too. They had things that they wanted. In particular, it can be very beneficial not only for college but also for your job if your math skills are complemented by very strong EQ, emotional quotient, emotional intelligence. Back to this whole concept of understanding people and being able to communicate with people. Because if you want to understand people, you need to be able to talk to them and then you can listen to what they say. If you never talk to them, then you're never going to get anywhere. Right? So, so that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the communication piece. Uh, and actually, I'll say, practically speaking, there were lots of high school students who are very good at math who were trying to get into these top colleges, and they would have difficulty because the top colleges were not satisfied only with IQ. They actually wanted EQ as well. So I started a new program for high schoolers. We find people who are really good at math in high school, and then we hire professional comedians, actors, and actresses to teach them the communication and the emotional intelligence. Importantly, we don't make them all the same. In fact, the actors and actresses, their attitude is every single person is beautiful in their own personality, but they might not have the confidence to put it up. Every single, that's the variety. The variety of humanity is that people all are different, but sometimes people are not confident to let their flavor be out. So we actually coach them on that piece. Yeah. <laughs> What's this program called? OK. Uh, it's called LIVE, L-I-V-E. I'll, I'll say more about it later if, you, if you're curious. OK, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess this shows that the incentives are lined up. Like, that's exactly what I try to do. I try to do something that actually people want. Um, I should actually say, the reason I, I, I knew I could do this is because it turns out that the university I teach at, Carnegie Mellon, is one of the top theater schools in the, in the country. So if you've heard of Hamilton, a bunch of those people were from Carnegie Mellon. If you've heard of the Tony Awards, we win a bunch of those every year. Academy Awards, our alumni win those too. Uh, actually, Carnegie built a building not very far from us here. Carnegie Hall. Yeah, yeah, so performing arts are like a, a big thing. So, so yeah, so we had all of these people. So, so I actually was able to build collaboration with actual actors and actresses. By the way, they spend as much time thinking about emotion as I spent thinking about math. It's, it's just like that is the job. The job is how to project emotion and how to connect with people. And it's not about making fake people. It's about making it so that you can actually carry on a conversation with someone else to learn and be more authentic of finding out what they are and be authentic about who you are without the lack of confidence of what will they say. It's actually very valuable. Let me also tell you, the reason that I knew that this would work is because I also took acting classes before. That was about six years ago. I was 35 years old. So I'm saying that because it's never too late. You don't have to do it when you're, don't have to do it when you're like only a, a kid. You can do it later. There were people in my class who were 65. OK, the, 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 these, are, these are improvisational comedy classes. And I'll tell you why I did this. I did this because uh, I was funded by the Overdeck Family Foundation. Uh, John Overdeck is the co-founder of Two Sigma, which in New York City maybe you have heard of before. It's one of the biggest hedge funds in the, in the world. And so uh, they, they, they funded me to work with a professional public relations firm called Rubenstein, also in New York City, on a campaign to make videos to make more people interested in math. That was the objective. Okay? Uh, and this was a great opportunity. They chose which public relations firm because they were providing the money. And so at some point, I then went to meet the public relations firm that was going to work with me to go and make these videos and this campaign. And they told me, oh, no, if you're going to be the guy in the videos, we have a problem. <laughs> because you don't know how to talk to normal people. You only know how to talk to math people. You need to take improvisational comedy classes. So I did. I searched for all the improvisational comedy classes in Pittsburgh. I found three theaters offering them. I enrolled in all of them. 
So I was doing about three hours a week of improvisational comedy. I will just show up for the classes in shorts and a t-shirt. I will just say, hi, my name is Poe. I didn't want anyone to know who I am. I'm just taking these random classes with strangers. It was terrific. I just pretended to be a college student. Okay? So I just showed up, took these classes. Okay? It changed my life completely. Because before that, I will tell you, I was the math team guy. Okay? I was the math team guy. Afterwards, it made me so that I could actually try to carry on a conversation with other people, which was really important because the public relations firm, I had a lot of motivation to do this because they told me one of the videos we're going to make is where we're going to do a, a video with you and some influencers. <laughs> and the influencers we picked are a cheerleading squad. <laughs> oh boy. Actually, when I was in high school, I actually didn't hang out with the cheerleaders. Or to be more specific, or to be more fair, the cheerleaders didn't hang out with me. <laughs> okay? So this is, this is a major challenge. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, we got funded. Better do it. Let's take those classes. This is what happened a, a year later. A year later. I think you get the idea. <laughs> if you want to see everything, you should, you should. It's a 10-minute video. Just go to YouTube and search for math cheerleading. There aren't that many hits. <laughs> okay? And we end up talking about even numbers. We end up talking about fractions. We have a great conversation. Actually, it was one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life. But if you had gone to me in high school and told that high school version of me, hey, in 20 years, you're going to go plunk down with a whole squad of cheerleaders you have never met in your life, we'll roll the cameras and film something and throw it on YouTube, I would have said, what planet are you on? There's no way. There's no way. I was, the, I was the math team guy. You know, I sat at the end of the table with the other math and science people. Okay? I was, I was like, I was the math guy at school. Right? I mean, I could talk to people. I was friends with people, sort of, you know, like in, in certain way. But I was definitely not invited to the cheerleader parties. I was not invited to the cheerleader parties. Okay? That was like a different thing. So I said, look, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So, so let's, let's go and build this thing for all these high school students. Okay? Uh, where we're going we're gonna to coach them. Um, right. And, and actually, it's because the Carnegie Mellon Theater Department is so strong. So we were able to make a win-win situation. I'll tell you how I did that. Actually, I did that because, you see, I told you, we need to talk to people, find out what problems they have, find a way to solve their problems. I just named a major high school need, which apparently was just confirmed by someone in the audience. This is a useful thing for high school students. So how do I make the whole thing work? Well, then I went to talk to the actors and actresses, the ones who are you know, graduating and going out. And I started to ask, you know, What's your life like? What, what can we do to help you? Are, is anyone interested in part-time, paid, remote work from home jobs on a flexible schedule that's predictable? And then I found out there were actually lots of actors and actresses who are interested in this. Because that's actually the name of the game. I didn't know this. I actually wasn't familiar with the way that people audition and what happens in life. But, you know, these people are extraordinarily talented. Extraordinarily talented. But it turns out that if you graduate from a top school like Carnegie Mellon in acting in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and you know you're going to make it on Broadway, what do you do right after you graduate? You move to New York, and then what do you do? You do all kinds of things to support while you audition. And I said, I didn't know that. Okay, would you want to do this job? And the answer was, yes. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a filmmaker based in Los Angeles. Actually, she also was interested in getting involved. And then she said, actually, you know, there's 100,000 uh, actors and actresses right now who would also be interested. Does anyone know why? There's a strike. The writers are off the strike, but the actors are still on it. Does anyone know why the, Does anyone know why the actors are on strike? Because of AI. 
It's all related. Everything in this talk is related in some strange way. AI. AI is actually coming and threatening the, the role of the actors, right? So, wow. Right, so actually what we built, let's wait until the end because we're, we're close to the end. There will be questions, okay? But um, what, we, what we built here is actually a win-win for the actors too. And it's also highly scalable. Like when I'm thinking about everything, I'm thinking about how to solve a problem on the national and global scale, right? My challenge I'm trying to solve is how to reach out to lots and lots and lots of middle schoolers. So then I need to know where are there lots of people. Oh, there's lots of high school students who like doing math and who would like to pick up this skill. Oh, and there's also lots of people who can coach them on the acting. Great, and let me connect everything together to the original problem. See, if you want to learn how to be a great communicator, you can't do it just by watching a professional actor or actress. What do you also need to do? Open your mouth and try, say something. And so here's the deal. If you go and find somebody who's really, really good at math, what's easier and effortless to talk about? How the Yankees did last night or the Pythagorean theorem? Like, it depends on the person, of course, but for many of us, it was the Pythagorean theorem. Why not? Let's go geek out about Fibonacci numbers. Let's go. Okay, that's what we did. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, exactly. Yay. And by the way, I say, I don't mean to be stereotypical. I have an amazing student, one of the top math students at CMU right now. It's from New York, and he's like a sports fanatic. Uh, actually, he's really, really good. But he's gonna, I think he's going to be a successful sports mathematician someday. That's a really good job, by the way. That's an insanely good job. But I'm just explaining. Like, well, what I saw was, well, there's an easy way for a lot of math people to practice this communication by live streaming the best live video math classes ever made to the middle school students. Because now suddenly I have a three-sided, it's a three-sided market, that's the technical way you'd explain it in economics, but it's a, we can also say it's a win-win-win situation where there are three parties and everyone got what they needed. The middle school students wanted to be able to talk to people who know tons of math and are interesting, but they couldn't find those after school. Now I got tons of them applying at the high school level, all trying to get in. The whole thing works. Let me show you what it actually looks like. And the reason is because sometimes academics, researchers, make research things, which are very important. You need to do a research thing and study it. I actually make implemented things. So I'm a practitioner. We actually made this whole thing. It's all, it all exists, and, and it has scaled up. We have 100 high school students in it. We've taught, we've taught like 2,000 middle school students already. And I want to show you what it looks like, because in order to make this work, we had to overcome a major challenge. And the major challenge was called how to do this online. Because remember, the, the specification of my goal was to reach out to the entire country. And you're lucky. In New York City, you've got all these great resources. Uh, there are other parts of the country which don't have an, like, a math circle or something like that where they are. So I had to do the whole thing online. And many of us learned through the online experience that it's very hard to keep kids' attention online. Or rather, let me, take that, let me take that back. It's very easy for things other than the math class to keep kids' attention online. Right? And so what I said was, OK, how do I solve this problem? What if we try to use our performing arts expertise and figure out how to grab the features of the other things that kids are watching instead of the math class to actually do math, not by making the math class be full of explosions or cartoon characters, that's not the point, but by using what the actors and actresses do called emotion. Actually, for many years, I tried to get people interested in math by telling them, it's good for you. You'll get a good job. It'll be good for you. I promise. This is a very good message to people who are in community college. They agree. They pay bills. It's a little bit more difficult to explain this to sixth graders. So what we do is we use the fact that, you know, in performing arts, you, people win other people over through sheer emotion. There's so much you can do with emotion. And it's another dimension that was not fully tapped. So I said, let's go and pull this in. And also, let's copy all the things that kids actually like to watch anyway. Let me show you a one-minute video clip of what we turned this math class into. And you'll see two people on screen. They are both high school students. They're both teaching, a boy and a girl. They're both teaching. And there are middle schoolers in the class, too, but they're not in this video clip because we cut that out for protecting the privacy. Normally, the middle school kids keep jumping on the camera as well, uh, but, uh, as some of you know. But, but this is the part of the high school students talking. This is what we turned math class into. So as we were saying, they still get the midpoint. That's a great point of value. And then now I'm seeing this. Since they go at the same speed, this, the green one goes here at the same time the red one goes there. And then 20 times 2 gives you 40. Because if it takes 20 minutes for green to go here from 
the first one to the red one. At 60 miles per hour, 20 minutes is 20 miles. And then this is also 20 miles, so we get 40. Awesome. Oh, I mean, Audrey, do you have anything else to add? I think that's a really good solution by, by you. Yeah, it's really good. And one of the better things about that solution is that you actually don't really need to know how fast the trains are traveling. You can just use the symmetry to sort of Yeah. See. So yeah. I actually like that you point out symmetry, because symmetry is always cool to see. And I think being able to see it in problems like this makes it more fun and also like makes it more elegant, I guess. But without further ado, Professor, is there another way to do this problem? But I promised you that there would be another way to do this question as well. We turned math class into a Twitch gaming stream. Did that make sense to people? So what, what I, I, we copied this style that people actually like to watch. Uh, in fact, I'll say I don't have the creativity to do this. When I was designing this, we were just like normally teaching. And then one of the high school students said, there's something called lights. I said, what are you talking about? He said, get some like colorful lights. I said, I don't know what you mean. But I went to Amazon and I bought all the lights I could find, shipped them to his house. And I said, go play. And a week later, boom, it was this. And I said, ah, that's what you mean. OK, cool. I actually think that the next generation knows what's going on. And what we need to do is we need to empower them. Uh, that's, that's actually how I operate. But then there are other things that we did here. You might have noticed there's two people. The two people is actually because I'm a graph theorist. I'll use that word because this is a math group. I'm a graph theorist. I'm a network theorist. When we, did, when we did two, one of the goals of doing this was to also build relationships between, like friendships between people who are really good at math. Remember I said this thing earlier about how sometimes people compete. We have a system where people who are teaching the class, they're actually from different parts of the country or different parts of the world, and they come to collaborate. We're building a giant network among all of these high school students that introduces New York people to people in Arizona, Romania, you name it. And then you suddenly have this network going on. And at the same time, it also makes a dynamic where it feels more like a talk show. This overcomes the problem that I had when I was teaching in classes. When I was teaching online classes, I just felt like I was the only one there. Because there were a lot of black rectangles with white names. And you ask a question, and no one says anything. And you wonder if anyone's actually doing in this class at all. But we found out when you put two of them, then everyone else joins in the chat, and they just have a good time. Because there's actually a dynamic conversation. OK, so that was one of the things we did. But the other thing we did here is we are also the first people in the history of education to do something, a twist. Uh, we, put a, we put a professionally trained actor or actress in every single classroom. No one's ever done that before. You might not have known that that's in every single classroom. But every single classroom has the people teaching, the people learning, and a professionally trained actor or actress. What that person's job is, is to make sure that the emotional energy is top. And they give real-time feedback to the high school student about the dynamism of what they just said, about their smile, about the posture, about all these things that their parents might have told them for the last five years. But uh, it works when it comes from an actress. It's actually really good. It's also, it's also like real-time feedback, OK? Uh, we did this in a way that was not possible before the internet. I like to think about how do you do something that you could not do before. See, in the real world, if you had the math person teaching and a Broadway-quality actress giving the math person feedback as they teach, who's going to watch me? She's much more interesting. Okay? But what we did with the online is we made it so that person's camera's off, microphone's off, and you don't even know she's there. The students taking the class had no idea. They were just like, the people are really good. They seem really interesting. There's a separate simultaneous video call happening between the high school students and the actor where they can see and hear each other and see all the feedback that the actor is typing in. High school students today can see text, react to text. And during all the classes, at some point, my part pops in for about three minutes and another three minutes. During those three-minute segments, actually, in the second call, the high school students and the actor are debriefing on the acting that just happened in the last. Now, this guy's nodding. He's, he's been in the class. He didn't know this. He thought that actually the people were just like playing Minesweeper or something. But no, what's actually going on is that the high school students are getting this constant feedback loop that's actually making them really good. OK. By the way, the high schooler doesn't pay anything. They get paid. OK. So now, what I just did, I blew away the incentives. Does that make sense? So this is actually why we're currently drowning in high school students trying to join the program. That was one of the biggest problems before, not enough coaches. Okay? I will say, practically speaking, 
the classes are not free on this side, so people pay for the classes, but people were already paying for after-school math classes. And what we also do on this side, because I told you I'm trying to do things that reach the whole country, we actually make it so that people who go to Title I schools and are eligible for free reduced lunch don't pay anything. So in fact, there's another angle of this entire thing where we're also working very hard to diversify the access pathways to extraordinary ability in math. So we're running the exact same ecosystem. People taking it, some of the people live in million dollar houses in Silicon Valley. Other people taking it, we've actually specifically gone into low income neighborhoods to recruit the highest motivation sixth graders to build specialized cohorts to go and study together to make it so that maybe in five, 10 years you might find out that there's some extraordinary people emerging from places that didn't always pop up before. This is actually what we do. And the reason we can do it is because we have this gigantic surplus of high school students all coming in. We know this is working because of the high school students who are here. So I'll just show this piece. These are the high school students who are already involved in, in actually coaching. So um, the achievements, I'll translate a little bit. So USAMO qualifier, that's like one of the top 250 in the country. Um, National Math Counts qualifier means one of the top four in a state. MOP is this program which invites about 60 US kids a year to go uh, study math in high school. Armin, by the way, is from Romania. Uh, Roma he's one of the top uh, Romanian math and computer science people. Romania, by the way, is the country that invented the International Math Olympiad, or well, they made the first International Math Olympiad. Elena is also incredible. Uh, she, one of these like, you know, top math people, also coaches her own team. Um, Jesse is actually the pres national president of the Mu Alpha Theta. I don't know if you guys uh, participate in that thing. Uh, you'll, you'll see him if you go to the convention. Michael, Michael is one of the top four students in Illinois, but he also, he's president of his high school student government. That happened after he joined our program. We're actually making it so that, high school, so that math people can get elected by everybody. We're making, high, we're making math people electable. I'm going to get more onto that as I close this talk, okay? So this is, this is actually much bigger objectives than actually teaching math. Uh, and the list goes on and on. I mean, the list of all these people who are involved in this, well, it's just, there's over 100 people here. This is the largest scale, super high density of people who are crazy good at math, who are all involved in coaching middle school students, suddenly solving the problem for how do you get access to all of this stuff after school. We have all of these people here. And now I want to say a little bit about how to get in. So actually, we have so many high school students applying that we have a pretty, pretty intensive admissions process, which is unique in that we don't only look for people who are good at math. Sorry, it's not enough to only be good at math. We actually require, and we, we filter for this, we require that everyone who comes in also actually really likes helping people. This feature was not part of the math competition world before. People would just say, who is the best? Although some summer camps might try to filter for this, and definitely US colleges filter for this. But we added this because that's my principle. So what we did here is, and I'll tell you why, it's because when I explained what this program was, uh, I was at some event that the mayor of my city was even at, and I was talking about this with someone, and afterwards somebody told me, you're making a group of really dangerous people because they are very clever, and you're giving them the skills to convince anyone to do anything. Those are potential SBFs, Sam Bankman-Frieds, right? Like if you have crazy smart ability and very good at talking, you can do fraud. And I said, well, that's, uh, I mean, that's what he did, right? He fooled so many people. But, but so I said, well, that's, that's why one of our criteria that we take very seriously is there's a four-stage application process. Part of it is an is audition video where we kind of see what kind of personality you are. There's a teacher recommendation. And we don't ask the, te we, the teacher recommendation says, don't tell us about the math. We know this person's good at math. Tell us about the character. The whole letter, we just want character. And then there's an interview. And based on all of these things, we start to figure out we can't be 100% sure, but we find people who are statistically slanted towards more likely to actually like helping people. Not because it gets you in college, but because it's actually what makes you happy. I'll tell you, I had an interview with one, one, one girl uh, that was last week or, or so. And you know, one of the questions I asked her was, what if one day you got rich and famous and you didn't have, not, not, not famous, but you were rich, didn't have to worry about anything, and you were only 40, what would you do? And she thought for a while, she hadn't thought about it before. And she said, you know, I'd probably start some organization to do education. And you could tell from the way she was talking, it was like genuine. And I poked her. I said, well, why? Why? You, you live in Florida. Suppose you have enough money. You could just chill on the beach. And then she just blurted out, but then I'd just be bored. What would I do? That's what I want. Does that make sense? So, so we're looking for people for whom, like the, the, the knee-jerk reaction is like, oh, um, 
that's just boring. I want to do something. Okay? So, so what we have done is we've built something for which we're pulling in all these high school students who have this idea. And then uh, we're teaching them how to win elections. <laughs> now you see what I'm really trying to do. <laughs> okay? so, so, so actually the goal of what we're trying to do here, this thing scales. We have 100 high school students. The goal is to get to 100,000 high school students a year. That would be enough capacity to teach a million middle school kids a year. We're trying to build a gigantic network where we've added a new, a new dimension to what does it mean to achieve. Uh, it is to actually like people. Uh, and you will see this. You'll see this as it starts to infect, infect the, the crowd of all of us who do math. Very important piece that we have here. And this is just what I do, okay? I'm, just, I'm sharing with you that's what I choose to do. It seems to be working. And I told you this story because we have a new world, ChatGPT. You can do things too. The things I described, like I'm using ChatGPT, using all these things to multiply what I, what I, what I can possibly do. And I, I think this is a group of very clever people. You never know what you'll be able to do too. Good luck. Yeah. Okay, I do want to make one emphasis. I want to point out one thing because I did say something related to politics, which is I want to say we actually have no philosophy that we impose on the high school students. It's not about Republican, about Democrat, or whatever. We don't care. We simply just want to find people who seem to like people. So this is like non, -pol non politically aligned. Uh, however, we're trying to get clever people who want to do something. Now, questions? Yeah. And also, say, um, if, say, like, is this. Is this kind of like the problem with AIs? Like, you know, if, if say you like make AIs like super, super smart, like smarter than, you know, smartest humans on earth, then some of them will, some will turn to people like Bill Gates who like, you know, want to help people, creating like organizations and all that. Some people turn to SBF. I mean, some, sorry, yeah. AIs yeah. will turn to Bill Gates and, you know, help people and all that. Some will turn to SBF and, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's a big problem. There's nothing that humans can do about it because we're no longer the smartest animals on earth. So I'm trying to make humans more intelligent. We're the smartest animals on earth. Smartest smart things, things on earth. That's right. We're trying to make people more intelligent. Any other quick questions? Because we, we went over because we started late. I want to let other people ask, okay? Are there any other questions? Because uh, we, you know, we started late, so I want to see if there's anyone else's questions, and then we'll wrap. Yeah. Yeah, what to do about phobia for math, right? I do feel like, first of all, a lot of people can do math, even the ones who don't think they can. Uh, the main challenge is to build up from what they currently can do to find out, yes, I can do that, and then build one more step, one more step, one more step. That, the main thing is they may not have had the opportunities to do that. But that's, that's what I would do if I'm trying to fix one person's phobia. Any other quick questions? Let's close with this one. And afterwards, if anyone has more questions, you can ask me in the front. Yeah. Uh, um, that website that you were building where you would talk about math. Oh, the website to talk about math. What's it called? What's it, called? Um, it will probably be called game.potionlow.com. It hasn't been launched yet, uh, but we are in the final touches of putting the whole thing together. And are you going to like, section it to use certain levels? We will eventually. It's just we're building a base, a foundation. The foundation is called the architecture of people doing math, explaining things to each other, and then we can add all these different things on top. That would be really helpful when it comes to competition as well. That's right. We thought about that. So it's all about starting with the right foundation and then building from there. With that, I'll be in the front if you have any further questions, but it was very nice to meet all of you. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.